please welcome to the lectern John Jordan. Thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me to come out here and talk about one of my very favorite subjects, the Texas Navy and its impact on the Revolution. Now, those of y'all who were here at the symposium last year may remember a piece of advice that Dr. Crisp gave that I thought was so useful then that it made sense to repeat it this year. Crisp's theorem, as I call it, goes something like this. If anyone tells you anything about the Texas Revolution, no matter what it was, simply look, what, look at them like you know what you're talking about and say, yes, but it wasn't that simple. <laughs> well, where the Texas Navy was concerned, things truly were not as simple as they seemed. And today I'd like to take Crisp's theorem in a completely different direction. I think technically in that direction, out towards the Gulf of Mexico and towards the rivers, the bays, and the port cities of Louisiana, Mexico, and Texas. Now, if you're like I was before I started learning about the Texas Navy's history, you may not be all that familiar with the ships that patrolled the Gulf of Mexico during the 1830s. And that makes sense because the ships back then were not only different from the naval vessels we see today, but they were even different from the classic warships we read about in the Patrick O'Brien or Horatio Hornblower novels. So let's take a look at what was prowling the Gulf of Mexico back during the 1830s. First, we had the Texas Navy's ships. Actually, it's wrong for me to call them ships. They were co considered vessels because they just weren't quite big enough to be called ships, although I'll slip up from time to time and call them ships anyway. The vessels Texas relied upon were, for the most part, schooners. A schooner, shown on the left of this picture, is for our purposes a two-masted vessel that has its sails rigged fore and aft. In other words, the sails run front to back, parallel to the deck. This is different from a square-rigged vessel, which has rectangular sails that are run perpendicular to the deck or crossways. Now, the Texas Navy liked its schooners. In fact, until 1839, three years into Texas independence, the Navy used only schooners. And why was that? Well, schooners were handy in the Gulf at that time for a few reasons. First, they had a shallow draft. In other words, the hull of the ship didn't sink too far into the water when you were trying to sail it. That was important because back in those days, Texas had very shallow sandbars that could rip off a rudder of a ship that got stuck on them, or even worse, at low tide, could potentially stick your boat where it flips over with disastrous results. At the time, Galveston was Texas's deepest port, and at low tide, its sandbars were as little as eight feet underwater. So you had to have a ship that was no more than eight feet underwater when it was loaded down. Another thing that was nice about schooners was they required fewer crewmen to work them. A schooner didn't have very many sails, maybe nine total. And with fewer sails, that meant you had to have fewer men to work the sails. And when you had fewer men, then that meant you had to carry less food aboard. You didn't have to store as much water. And if you got into a fight with somebody, you had more guys out there who could man the big guns or fire muskets at the other side. Of course, schooners weren't perfect vessels. If you got a uh, cannonball ripping through one of your sails and you don't have that many sails, then that's going to slow you down quite a bit. Now, here's an example of a real Texas warship. It's uh, from a picture of a ship that came on board uh, a few years after the Revolution, but was virtually identical to the ones that would have defended Texas in the early months of 1836. This is the Texas Navy warship San Antonio. This type of schooner is called a Baltimore topsail schooner. Uh, it's called a topsail because the two top rows of sails are square rig sails, like I spoke about a moment ago. And this particular design was very popular in the Gulf of Mexico with both merchants and uh, naval commanders. There are actually a few uh, Baltimore schooners still sailing around the world today. Uh, one of them, called the Pride of Baltimore II, 
is a ship that is, uh, sails the seas and oceans, but it is about in the, uh, the same configuration as the ships that defended Texas during its revolution. Now the other type of popular ship was called a brig. Brigs, like schooners, also had two masts, but unlike schooners, their sails were square rigged, as you can see from this picture. Of course, it took a few more sailors to run a brig, but it had some advantages as well. With a tailwind, or the wind at your back, they were a little bit faster than schooners. So these were also fairly popular among different naval uh, commanders and merchants back during the 1830s. Of course, one thing to remember about these warships, no matter what we're talking about, brigs, schooners, or anything else, the thing to remember is these were not the giants of the Spanish Armada's days. To illustrate the size of the Texas and Mexican naval vessels, let's see, actually this is a picture of a modern brig. There we go. To show you the size of the Texas and uh, Mexican naval vessels, here you see a picture of a ship of the modern U.S. Navy, believe it or not, uh, the USS Constitution, still commissioned today. Uh, it's a 44-gun frigate, and uh, this would be considered a fifth-rate ship of the line. Now here's how that worked. In Britain's Royal Navy, which was the one that set the standard for everybody back then, a frigate like the Constitution was considered fifth-rate. Now the first-rate ships were huge. They were floating cities. They could carry 120 guns on three giant decks. The second rates, well, they were a little bit smaller, maybe 100 guns, and so on down the line till you get to the Constitution here with a measly 44 guns. Now, you see that little boat in front of the Constitution? Well, that's a schooner, and that is more or less what Texas and Mexico were using back during the Revolution. After all, a big old ship like the Constitution couldn't possibly fit into the shallow ports of Texas. And the thing to remember is that when you don't have the big ships of Lord Nelson's Navy, then you don't have the big battles of Lord Nelson's era. This picture of Trafalgar, England's epic battle with Napoleon's fleet, would have been nothing like the battles that the Texas and Mexican navies were waging against each other during the Revolution. Quite simply, the ships weren't that big, and the fleets weren't that big. So while we say that everything is bigger in Texas, one exception to the bigger Texas rule was the fleets at the time. So let's talk about what Texas really did have, and I'd like to start with the iron men that ran the wooden ships. The first one was the Commodore of the Fleet, uh, who ran the flagship Independence. His name was Captain Charles E. Hawkins. Captain Hawkins, like a lot of the men in the Texas Navy, was a veteran of the U.S. Navy, but he was also a veteran of the Mexican Navy, serving, for Me serving Mexico during the 1820s. In 1829, Captain Hawkins left the Mexican Navy service to come back east to work as a riverboat captain in my neck of the woods along the Chattahoochee River, and he returned to, in North Georgia, and he returned to Texas uh, in, uh, once war broke out. Texas' next warship, the Invincible, was commanded by a Rhode Islander named Captain Jeremiah Brown. Jeremiah Brown came to Texas in the early 1830s and, like a lot of other naval commanders, was started, started out as a riverboat pilot along the Brazos. The Liberty, another warship, was captained by William S. Brown, the brother of Jeremiah Brown. He was a tough guy. He'd fight on land or sea. He didn't care. He wasn't particular. He took part in the fight at Bear, and he claimed to have designed one of the early historical Texas battle flags. He was a tough old sea captain. And finally, we have the Brutus, commanded by Captain William A. Hurd, an even tougher old salt. He started his career in Texas as a privateer and gun runner. Uh, captain Hurd actually shed the first blood of the Texas Revolution in September of 1835, weeks before hostilities broke out on land, and he was something of a tyrant aboard his own ship. These four men were commissioned by the Texas government in the middle of March of 1836, shortly after independence was declared. And speaking of independence, that's the name of the flagship of the Texas fleet. The independence began its career as the U.S. revenue cutter Ingham. Now, a revenue cutter is just a fancy name for a small armed ship that was designed to patrol the coast. 
They were kind of like the swift boats of their days. They were designed to go into shallow bays and rivers and catch pirates and smugglers and anybody who didn't pay their import duties, which is why they were with the U.S. Revenue Service. As you can see from the slide here, the Independence was not a very large vessel. It carried maybe two dozen men at a minimum on its crew and was only about 73 feet long, so it was considerably smaller than the width of this uh, room here we're in today, which seems like a pretty long way if you're up here looking at a lot of people out in the audience, but if you had to be stuck on it for a couple of months, it might get a little cramped. Here we have a picture of another revenue cutter uh, the, uh, at, at Anchor, uh, very similar design. And the reason I include it here is because this was actually uh, a watercolor done by a Texas Navy midshipman. The next ship of the Texas Navy was the Liberty, which began its naval career as a privateer a little bit before independence was declared. It was bought in New Orleans by Stephen F. Austin and his compatriots just about the time Santa Ana's men were moving north. Next, we have the second heaviest ship of the Revolution, the Invincible. The Invincible was built in Baltimore for the African slave trade, which was illegal at the time, so the ship had to be built fast. The Invincible has the distinction of being the straw that helped break the provisional government's back. As some of you may know, before Texas declared independence, it had a provisional government consisting of a governor, a gentleman named Henry Smith, and a general council, which acted kind of like its Congress. Well, Smith and the general council didn't get along with each other. There was no love lost there. And the council decided one day that they wanted to send a couple of guys out to buy the Invincible and fit it out for an attack on the Mexican port at Matamoros. Well, Smith thought this was a harebrained idea, and he wouldn't let them do it. So they did it anyway. Well, with that, Smith blew up called the general council all sort of fighting words, even fighting words by today's standards, and announced on January 10th that he was shutting down the general council. Well, what did the general council do? Nothing. They went on about their business as if the governor wasn't ever there. And Governor Smith went on about his business as if the council wasn't there. So unfortunately for the Texians, by the end of January, Texas didn't have a government to speak of. And that's how the Invincible helped bring down the weak provisional government in early 1836. Finally, we have the Brutus. Brutus was the last ship to join the Texas Navy, although she was supposed to have been the first. She was bought in New Orleans in December 1835 by Texas agents Ed Hall and Gus Allen. Allen, of course, being one of the founders of Houston. They began fitting out the vessel and preparing to take aboard volunteers to fight for Texas. But when the, sh the insurance companies that were insuring Mexican commerce in the Gulf got wind of what was going on, they ran straight to the district attorney claiming that the Texans were violating U.S. neutrality laws. Well, the district attorney was a Texas sympathizer, but he had to do something about it. So he went back to Ed Hall and made Mr. Hall swear on a Bible that he had no intentions of doing anything to Mexican shipping or Mexican ships with the Brutus. In fact, he said that the guns he was bringing on board the ship were purely for self-defense. I mean, Texas was a dangerous place at that time. The district attorney believed him, or so he said, and allowed the Brutus to leave the New Orleans port carrying seven cannon and 100, rifle, 100 mu musket men of the Alabama Red Rovers to protect the Brutus's precious cargo of about 40 barrels of flour and some other junk. <laughs> now, what did Mexico have to field against the Texas fleet? The records, unfortunately, are not very good, but from the records that we have that still remain today, we know, or rather we think we know, that Mexico fielded four warships along the Gulf Coast during this time. The first one was called the Moctezuma, although, it, and it may have been renamed the Bravo. The records are a little bit ambiguous here. Mexico also had the two-gun schooner Correo Segundo de Mexico, uh, the Brig General Urea, and the schooner Veracruzano. Now these four warships, like those of Texas, were manned by a mixture of, of nationalities. There were some Americans serving in Mexican service, just like Americans serving in Texas service. There were a few Royal Navy seamen as well, 
But generally, Mexico's fleet was commanded by Mexican officers. Now, Mexico's naval officers were quite good. In general, they were proficient mariners who took their jobs every bit as seriously as the Texans took their jobs. In some cases, they made excellent naval tacticians. But the problem they had, like the problem of the Texas Navy later on, was that they suffered from a lack of government funding and interest. Sam Houston and Santa Ana were both generals at heart, and they really didn't have a whole lot of interest in what the Navy could do to help their land campaigns. We heard earlier this morning about Santa Ana's transport of his men to Tampico in 1829, but by the time of the Texas Revolution, that seems to have left Santa Ana's planning process. No, instead of Santa Ana, actually the credit for building up the Mexican Navy goes to this gentleman, Jose Maria Tornel, the highly educated Secretary of Defense during the Mexican Revolution. And with that, I'd like to turn to how these men of war affected the Texas campaign on land. If you take a look at a map, any map, you can easily tell that the supply routes to the Texas Revolution, which came from New Orleans, Mobile, Pensacola, those run across the Gulf of Mexico. That's the fastest way to get volunteers, horses, cannons, and guns to Galveston. Additionally, Texas and Mexico shared a long curved coast. So you could imagine that warships would play some part in the big drama that was unfolding on land. Now, not many people know it or perhaps realize it, but some of the first bloodshed of the Texas Revolution occurred at sea rather than on land. This happened on the 1st of September, 1835, weeks before the outbreak of hostilities on land, when the Mexican revenue cutter Correo de Mexico stopped a merchant brig entering the Brazos River mouth. The gun runner San Filippi, commanded by Captain William Hurd, the tough old guy we talked about a moment ago, opened fire on the Correo, killing one crewman and capturing the ship. Well, after independence was declared by uh, Texas, the first official capture occurred in March of 1836 off Mexico's Yucatan coast. Now, Yucatan at the time was, seemed to be kind of the New England of Mexico. It was a big center of sea trade because it was a great stopping point if you were traveling from Cuba, the United States, the Caribbean, and you were getting your goods to central Mexico. Here's a closer view of, of uh, Yucatan, and from, from the picture of the Texas Navy map that you see hovering off the northwest point, that's about where Captain William Brown's Liberty was patrolling in March of 1836. One evening, Captain Brown crept within a few miles of the armed harbor of Cecil, where he spotted a big, fat merchant brig just ripe for the taking. He couldn't wait, but he held off just a few hours until darkness. Then, instead of going in guns blazing, he quietly sent over a boatload of about 14 roughnecks, heavily armed with tomahawks and pistols. They managed to climb up the side of the brig and overpower the soldiers who were stationed there to guard it. They killed several soldiers, drove off a few others, and as the alarm spread over the castle, they managed to get the sails out and pull the ship out of port just as the cannons opened up. What they found was that they had captured a brig named the Pelicano. It was actually a smuggler uh, because it had several compartments where jewelry and other goods were hidden, but its chief purpose was to carry big barrels of cargo. And the first thing the Texans found was 550 barrels of foodstuffs, flour, apples, and other things that would have been great eating for an army that was hungry. Well, when they brought the ship to, into Matagorda to, uh, to unload its cargo, the, the, the uh, Pelicano got stuck on the bar. Ultimately, it wrecked. But before it did, they managed to get 500 some odd barrels off the ship. Well, one of the barrels that they were carrying ashore dropped and broke open. And inside that barrel, they found another barrel. So they broke open that barrel, and they found out that it was a keg of gunpowder. Well, that was a nice little discovery. So they were uh, able to take the gunpowder and food and ship it over to uh, Sam Houston's army to put to use later at the Battle of San Jacinto. Now, as you can imagine, by the end of March 1836, the Texas Army was in bad need of some good news to report. And at the end of March, Sam Houston trumpeted the capture of the Pelicano in a proclamation to the people of East Texas. 
Of course, as you can imagine, that also caused an uproar in New Orleans where those shipping merchants and those insurance companies were getting pretty steaming mad at what the Texans were doing. And they were also raising the insurance rates for any Mexican ships that were leaving port, making it more expensive for Mexico to import the goods it needed. So with that, I'd like to talk about the San Jacinto campaign. But before we get to the blood and guts of the battles, the fun part, I'd like to spend a moment stressing the importance of logistics on Santa Ana's battle plan. After all, brilliant tactics and great battlefield leadership, Sam Houston's decision at the fork in the road, the uh, alleged recreation of Santa Ana just as the uh, battle began to open, all the stuff that makes for good military legends wouldn't count for a whole lot if the armies disintegrated from hunger before they got to the field of battle. Now, it's important to remember that Santa Ana, like all the armies of the day, had what we call a foot and hoof army. The men marched, the oxen pulled the carts behind them. Santa Ana's men were not able to fa travel any faster, really, than the legions of Julius Caesar nearly 2,000 years before. And so if an army like that could make 12 to 20 miles in a day, that army was having a pretty good day. Well, when you're traveling at that rate, it would take a minimum of several weeks for Santa Ana reasonably to expect his army to get from central Mexico up to the Galveston region where the revolution was being supplied. Of course, if you had fertile countryside and you were marching in late summer or fall, then no problem. You could take your pick from the local crops or just requisition the livestock to feed your men. But if you all have ever driven through South Texas in February and March, you probably get a good idea that there wasn't a whole lot growing there that was edible. So let's take another look at the distances Santa Ana had to travel when he was thinking about his logistics tale. As you can see from this map drawn by our old friend Stephen Austin, Santa Ana marched his army in two basic groups. And this is a rough map, but you can get the general idea. One went up the coast, one went through central Mexico towards San Antonio. Now Santa Anna, like every other general of the day, was a student of Napoleon. Remember, he called himself the Napoleon of the West. And it would make sense that he and his staff would have been aware of some of Napoleon's experiences when planning their own long-term campaigns. So let's take a look uh, briefly at some military history Santa Anna would have had in his mind or should have known about in some detail as he began his campaign. Now, this picture shows some of Napoleon's bigger blockbuster campaigns, the, one that Santa, the ones that Santa Anna would have known about in intimate detail. The red ones are ones Napoleon lost, and the blue ones were ones Napoleon won. And as you can see from this list, where Napoleon's men were marching short distances, or when they went through fertile countryside, like through northern Italy or Austria or Germany, then Napoleon was able to keep his men fed, they fought well, and they generally won. But when Napoleon marched his army far from his home base, uh, or through barren ground like the Egyptian campaign or the campaign against Russia in 1812, well then his army began to break apart because his men couldn't keep themselves fed. They began to starve and he lost. So Napoleon's famous pun that an army crawls on its belly really meant something back then. Well, Santa Ana knew about these campaigns, and he also may have been thinking about his own campaign against Zacatecas in 1835. There, he only had to travel about 400 miles from Mexico City to get to the heart of rebellion and crush it. But Texas was neither nearby, nor was it rich and fertile, and Santa Ana was going to have a tough time feeding his men. The solution, of course, was the Gulf of Mexico. A straight line drawn from Mexico City to Galveston runs straight across the Gulf, beginning roughly at the Mexican port of Tampico. Mexico was blessed with a number of pretty good ports, including Veracruz, it's probably its, its best port. And if any of these ports were used by Santa Ana and his men, then the journey to Galveston, where the supplies were coming in, ultimately where the, the, go the civil government fled, would have been a very short one, three or four days under good, good sailing conditions at the, at the worst. So Santa Ana was, of course, of course, had the option of going by sea, 
But of course he went by land, and by April 21, as we all know, his advanced guard reached the vicinity of San Jacinto, and the battle was fought between these two men. And of course the battle ended like this, and the revolution lived happily ever after. <laughs> but it didn't have to end that way. That's because the Mexican army was still larger and in many ways better equipped than Sam Houston's army even after the reverse at San Jacinto. So let's take a look at the picture the day after the battle. Now, as you can see from this slide, and, and the, uh, admittedly, the accounts are not perfectly precise. In some cases, they conflict. But the Texas Army still had roughly some 800-odd men, still probably about the same number of horses they started the battle with. And then they had three cannons, the two twin sisters and the one they, they captured from Santa Ana. Remember, though, Houston was going to have to split off some of his men to guard that batch of 600 prisoners he had captured. The Mexican army, by, by contrast, had three separate groups, each of which had almost as many men, if not more men, than in Sam Houston's entire army. This formidable fighting force was commanded by this gentleman, uh, Major General Vicente Filisola. General Filisola was born in Italy. He served in the Italian army beginning in 1804, and then served in the Spanish army and the Imperial Mexican army before joining the Army of the Republic. He had been a very successful commander, and he knew what he was doing. And as you can see from this map, he had a lot to work with. Uh, Houston effectively was confronted by three significant forces. And undoubtedly, none of those forces were going to be as careless as Santa Ana had been a few days earlier. Putting it another way, the balance of power, if Filisola had consolidated his forces, looked something like this. Santa Ana's ar old army, now under Filisola's command, outnumbered Houston some perhaps four to one. So why did Filisola retreat? I mean, the, he had several options available to him. For instance, if he wanted to be very aggressive, he could have consolidated all his forces together and attacked Sam Houston while he possessed an overwhelming advantage. <coughs> if he wanted to be a little more conservative, he could have consolidated his armies and marched on Galveston, where the Texas civil government had taken refuge. That would have forced Sam Houston to come after him. He could have sat where he was and called up reinforcements from San Antonio, or he could have retreated. Now, we know that he retreated, ultimately, but the question is, why? What made him think that his large army was not going to be able to wage an effective campaign? There are a number of theories that have been kicked around, many of them by the Mexican generals who were with Filisola at the time. But only one of these really seems to hold up from a military sense. Perhaps Filisola was fearful of Santa Ana's life. After all, if he attacked, the, the, Texas, the Texans might execute the Generalissimo. But that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's hard to think of, of the government uh, ever sanctioning the loss of a province like Texas over to spare the life of one general. Besides, if you really wanted to spare Santa Ana's life, wouldn't it have been better to negotiate from a position of strength rather than weakness? It could be that Filisola lost his nerve or just became a coward, but that doesn't make much sense either. Although he was accused of cowardice in later years, remember, he had been a soldier for some three decades. He came of age during the Napoleonic Wars, and he, he was a very competent fighter. No, I think the, the answer that makes the most sense, that rings the truest, and one that Filisola used more to justify his, his retreat than, than possibly any other, was that his men simply didn't have the food and supplies. Uh, remember, since leaving Mexico, they hadn't had any significant loads of supplies. Many of them were able to gather food in towns like Columbia or Harrisburg or San Filipe, but they really didn't have a lot of significant fresh rations or new supplies to speak of. So there are lots of theories put forth as to why Filisola conceded Texas to the Texans, but the one that seems to make the most difference is this one, that he lacked the food and supplies. This makes a little bit more sense if you think about it. His army was not only in a wretched condition, so reasonably he might have believed that the Mexican army was no longer capable of making the lunge to the Sabine River. <coughs> 
Additionally, it was a good sound reason that he could offer to his government. It wouldn't be palatable to tell his government he was a chicken of Sam Houston. But what he could tell them was that his army, in his military judgment, was unable to continue the campaign further. Of course, in the end, there were lots of small decisions that led to the Mexican army's retreat. In his marvelous book, Sea of Mud, author Greg Dimmick describes the small steps backwards taken by the Mexicans that ultimately led to the evacuation of Texas. But one thing that logically affected the Mexican army more than any other was the lack of food needed to sustain a campaign. Of course, the Mexican government knew that supplies would be a problem. And in March of 1836, they began assembling a small flotilla of merchant vessels with one mission, get the grub to the troops. That flotilla consisted of three merchantmen, the Newcastle, the John M. Bando, and coming in from New Orleans, the Pocket. And it was escorted by two Mexican naval warships. But the mission was scrubbed by the timely intervention of the Invincible under Captain Jeremiah Brown. Now, here's a romanticized picture of a battle between a schooner and a brig. And of course, we all know that in movies, naval battles involve maneuver, wind, high drama, and Russell Crowe. <laughs> but in the world of the Texas Revolution, it was a lot different. On April the 3rd, 1836, Jeremiah Brown's ship sailed to the Rio Grande mouth flying United States flags. There they spotted the Bravo, which had been crippled by a broken rudder. Well, the, the, the target was way too tempting for anyone to resist. And I think flying an American flag and attacking a crippled enemy proves beyond a doubt that in the Texas Revolution, all was fair in love and war, or at least war. Well, Captain Brown came up in a real friendly manner to the Mexican ship. He sent over a, a Texas Navy officer dressed as a US Navy lieutenant. And after the Texas officer came aboard, they milled around for a few minutes, but something went wrong. We'll never, we don't know what happened. Maybe somebody was spotted on the Texas ship. Maybe the US Navy lieutenant was found out. But a gun battle broke out between the two vessels. It lasted for perhaps an hour and caused some damage to each ship from what it appears. The accounts are uh, certainly not very consistent here. And later on, Jerry Drake will help us shed some light on it, perhaps. In any event, the two vessels battled until a strange ship appeared on the horizon. And Jeremiah Brown, since he had a working rudder, did not want to get caught between two warships. So he backed away to intercept the mystery ship that was coming in. The ship turned out to be the brig Pocket, a merchant vessel loaded with 600 barrels of flour and food for Santa Ana's army, ammunition, supplies, military dispatches, and supposedly plans to land another 1,000 men at Galveston. Brown easily captured the Pocket and took her back to Galveston, where again it caused another ruckus for the Texas agents back in New Orleans. So ultimately, the expedition failed. The ships weren't able to leave port, and they weren't able to get those supplies to Santa Ana's army that was moving through Texas. The Invincible, along with her sister ships, the Liberty, the Independence, and the Brutus, were able to block supplies coming from the United States to Mexico to Santa Ana's army. The Texas Navy also ensured by keeping the Gulf clear, it would be able to keep supplies, the volunteers, the horses, the ammunition, coming through from New Orleans so that they could be put to use for the rebels. Ultimately, the lesson to be learned, I believe, is that the Navy and the Army have to cooperate. A few years later, General Filisola himself wrote that the posts of Texas are not sustainable while the maritime force doesn't cooperate with the operations of the land service. And I think that's, that's a good message that you can take from the interaction between the Texas Navy and the, the, uh, Army, the Texas Army fighting on land. This conclusion has been uh, looked at by military experts over the years. In the mid-1930s, uh, Brigadier General Teddy Roosevelt, Jr., the son of the president, noted, claimed that without the Texas Navy, in fact, there wouldn't have been a Lone Star Republic, and possibly the state of Texas would be part of Mexico today. In 1944, Admiral Chester Nimitz took time out from his very busy schedule that year <laughs> to talk about how the Texas Navy was able to command control of the Gulf and 
in, and contribute to the, uh, to the ultimate land campaign. Well, that's it. Writing about the Texas Navy was a joy, and speaking about it to you live today is a real pleasure, and I do hope that I can meet as many of you as possible at the question and answer session.